What's up guys, it's Sean Black at FM Evolution. Welcome back. I'm so excited to continue our leadership series and uh, we're doing a live event here and I'm with Jim Robinson. Hey buddy. Hey, good morning, afternoon, whatever it is at the show, Wherever I don't know. Wherever you are. It's a blur. Right. <laughs> uh, so Jim, if you guys don't know, is a CEO of CGP Maintenance and Construction Services Inc. Uh, author, business coach, speaker, chairman of a nonprofit, and of course, you know, a leader in this industry for facility maintenance. That's, yeah, that gives me something to do on a Monday. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm looking for something to do on a Tuesday. So I want to, I mean, we talk about uh, communication all the time because it is, it is absolutely critical uh, as a leader to be a great communicator and, and, and really use those skills with your team. So we're gonna kind of go through those things today and, and uh, kind of get some feedback from you on that. Let's do it, let's advice. go, let's take a deep dive. We'll take, take a deep dive here. So uh, obviously with the way the market is, there's more entrepreneurs than there ever has been in, in, in any, uh, probably any period of history right now, because it's so easy to, to kind of get going and get started, but we both know that that may not be the case is to continue to grow and, and run the company. Um, you know, uh, that takes a lot of communication, a lot of skill. In your opinion, what do you think are the, the most important actions that someone needs to take when starting a business? Well, understanding why you're trying to get into business, I think is a critical component. You gotta know one, what, what's your craft that you're really trying to put in mm -hmm. as a business model and what does that model look like? You wanna get some research done before you start. We know historically businesses go out of business, 95% are gone in three years. Another three or 4% are gone in five. So the success rate is one or 2%. And that's really because you grow rapidly because you're the number one salesperson when you own the company. And as you get into building that company, the thing you fail at is recruiting the right people to play in the game with you. And so you, at three years, you're, you're stretched so thin, tax problems can show up. There's what we call an abyss. We teach this class on, on how to grow, but there's an abyss. There's a hole between 500,000 and a million. And every time you fall into one of those holes coming out, you need guidance. So you need coaches, you need other groups or committees. You need things to guide you through those process. So I would say one, be very well planned. If you're gonna be an entrepreneur, you better be planned and you better be ready to hire people. So you gotta like people, you gotta care about people, you gotta be willing to serve people. Yeah, I mean, I, we talk about having that team is super critical because you just don't know, you don't know, you know? And so yeah. kind of having those people to around to surround yourself with the right people is absolutely critical. Yes. What do you think are the most common mistakes that people make when they're striking out on their own to start their own business? One of the biggest mistakes I'd say is trust. You have to develop trust in other people very rapidly. Hopefully you have a little bit of that when you come into being an entrepreneur. It is one of the critical things because you have to let things go. And you kind of have to do that in faith or belief that things are going to be executed at a high level that you would do. And that takes a tremendous amount of trust. And the trust will build the employee or that person around you, that teammate. Yeah, it'll build them, but you got to give them trust. And that's probably the hardest thing for a new business starting out. In business, you go in there for freedom or money. Yeah, exactly. And you give up one to get the other. It's not both. You don't get both when you go into business because you got to make money, but you got to work nonstop. <laughs> and there, there's a heck of a cross to bear that you have to carry that all day and night, every day and night. You can give it away. You can give pieces of it away, but it's still yours to own. And uh, so there, there, it's a journey, and uh, the freedom okay. thing is sacrificed at a, at a compound, complex level. Yeah. I think it's funny, you know, we talk about all the time that unless you own a business, you don't really understand what it's like to be that person, right? To be that you don't. leader. You don't. I mean, in role, you understand your role, you understand how the complexities work. But when you're an entrepreneur, you're the owner and responsible for all roles. And even if there's a person in the role, you're still responsible. And so that uh, there's a lot of moving parts and those today are faster than at any other time in my 37, 38 years of business. Yeah, it's much different today. And you, we, we, me, I have to learn all the time what's happening today. Now you got to stay current. You know, we talk a lot about also strengths and, and weaknesses of people, you know, uh, and I think there's 
a lot of different uh, back and forth on this. Some people go, you know what? Go all in on your strengths. Just double down on them and don't worry about your weaknesses. You know, and then others say, no, 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 you need to focus on your weaknesses and really come up with, you know, systems to improve them. What what do you think? What what do you how what's your approach in dealing with people's strengths and weaknesses? Especially well, as a leader. Learning disciplines around the weaknesses to make them a strength is a critical component. It's not something you should be focused on, it's something you should be aware of, and that's the education process. When you have a strength, it's a very natural it's a very natural behavior to just do well in your strength. There's that old saying that your strength is your weakness, your yeah. weakness is your strength. And there's, there's a, that's complex and a reality at the same time. So you think about that, you know, what's making you really good is also what's going to break you. And the things that are holding you back is also what's going to make you. And so being able to understand that process, one, and find your weaknesses, find somebody to fill them. Henry Ford was probably the greatest gift on this. Mm. And he, he, you know, he said that, you know, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. In fact, he was put on trial for not being smart and owning Ford. He says, but I am smart enough to get the right people around me. And really in business, depends on where you're at. You may have to outsource to get those really smart people. You may be able to hire. It depends on your where you're at in your revenue growth. But having those key players that can fill those spots that is a weakness for you, the owner, or even in a role, you got to make sure you're getting the right people in the game. Hmm. It's interesting. And the other thing I was thinking about is when you're going through that process and you know, we talk about it as a, being self-aware, but how do you, if you're new to this, how do you, how do you do that? Like, how do you identify what is your weakness and, and what's your strengths? What, what's your best recommendation for doing that? Think. Think. <laughs> I like to think things simple, man. Think. You, you know, I guarantee you, you know, if you just sit and think in just in a quiet moment for a second. You already know because it's your critical process that you go through, right? You don't mm. think critically about your strengths every day. Those critiques you have on yourself are your weaknesses. When you start to chew on yourself or you're grinding on yourself or you're beating yourself up, that's your weaknesses. Beating yourself up is a yeah, weakness. Absolutely. And those other components that you're beating yourself up over, those are your weaknesses. Mm. Go find somebody to either fill those spots or find a discipline, uh, on a, a, basically a better behavior to, to shore up the weakness. But those that's the obvious way to find what's really going on. Yeah. Don't overthink it. We all know what your weakness <laughs> or your strength will be. Yeah, I mean, I think that's it. And, you know, my always my thing too also is just ask. You know, if you got other great leaders around you and they know you, ask. Yeah. They'll, they'll tell you. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, <laughs> they'll tell you what you're good at. Yeah. And they also tell you, they'll really tell you what you're not good at. Ask employees. I, yeah. I've said this for many years. I, I say your first employee or your employee yeah. that has most recently been employed, yeah. sit down with them because they got, they got nothing to hide. And sit down with them after two, three, four weeks, set them aside. They don't care about that job yet. They're not loyal in their in their beliefs of your what your culture or values may be. They're going to tell you in a raw way. I think this, I think this, and I think this. You should change and you should fix. And they'll give you some really candid conversation. The beauty of that is, is that also builds more loyalty with that employee that had that opportunity to share with you. So it's probably the fastest, greatest critique to get. Yeah. And there's no responsibility to them to give that. It can be a very fearless thing. Very, uh, it can be both. It can be a, you know, a gratitude thing or it can just be an absolute critique. We've had both. Hmm. Interesting. So we're talking about communication, and I, I, th I can't help but not bring up the disc. Yeah, I love the disc. I know you do. <laughs> so we both study the disc a lot. You're an mm. expert on this at this point. <coughs> and, you know, we've had tons of conversations on the disc and how mm -hmm. we use it compared to how others use it. But uh, m maybe for those who don't understand the, the disc, can you kind of give a a general review of, of how we use it and, and, and uh, what your opinion is. Excuse me. Um, basically, DISC is a, it's an assessment. It's kind of telling others how you're going to communicate and the speed in which you'll communicate. So is it detail-oriented? Is it slow? Is it accelerated? Is it bulldozing? Is it what is it that, that you communicate with? There's a D, I, and an S, and a C. 
and they, each one of us stand or represent a certain uh, communication behavior or characteristic. So it's really, it's really primarily not so much how we're going to perform, but how we're going to communicate about how we should be performing. And so it, it's a very unique task, been around forever. Was, uh, 60s probably or 70s was the first. It's been rewritten a few times, more so in the last few years. People have rewritten it because they thought they had a better program. Mm. They were, the original DISC is truly the best, and it'll also give you the values assessment behind that. That's interesting. We talk about the values because the disc is a communication style. It's how you communicate but it's not who you are, right? A lot of people say your behavior is not who you are. It's just how you're behaving at the time. The disc is kind of like that too, right? That's where those values come in. That tells you a lot more of uh, the motivation behind that. So the, D the DISC will give you an adaptable behavior, characteristic of a communication, and it gives you your natural behavior. That natural behavior, the more it aligns with your adaptable, the less you are stressed, and you are real in the moment when those lines line up. Yeah. It's when the adaptable is completely different under pressure, circumstance, job, career, office, whatever. If it's fluctuating a lot, you probably tend to be a more stressful person. Yeah. The more in line those are, means no matter what's happening, you don't shift. Your communication style remains the same. It's pretty clear, pretty real. Yeah, you know, we, we've seen some of those discs where you have a two over shift and one just boom drops and yeah. then an adaptive and, and then under pressure, it, it doesn't match at all. Yeah. It's like, oh, something's not congruent with yeah. what's going on in their life right now. You they're, know? they're trying to be something they're not. not so yet. they're shifting into to a discussion or a pattern. Or, you, you can see this when they change octaves frequently in a communication skill. Yeah. If they change octaves at a radical level, I guarantee you they're stressed they, <laughs> because it's not it's not their normal behavior. And so they've adjusted really quickly. It's like when you talk to a baby, it's you're adjusting to speak to that baby like that baby cares what you're saying. <laughs> it's there's an adjustment there, yeah. and that will create an unnecessary shift or behavior change of stress. That's really interesting. I definitely, I, I definitely know that uh, you'll recommend going out and learning your disc, right? Yeah. And and for people who don't know, go take that test because it is helpful for you in your in your in your journey. Right. To yeah. kind of understand your own communication style. It helps uh, with understanding who you are, how you're going to communicate with other people. And that means communicate to them, with them or for them. Mm. And there, there's a big difference in that. And your DISC will define your communication skill. Do you prefer to be talked with or do you prefer to be doing the talking? That DISC will define that for you. Yeah. Depends on which what your profile really is. I think it's interesting because as you kind of go through this and you learn your disc and you kind of understand your communication method, they don't always match up with other people's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are no two alike to my knowledge. No, no, not really. No. So you really, I think the understanding also is when you, when you're talking to other people and you understand their communication style and what disc they are, you, it helps give you at least some guidelines to kind of achieve, you know, a little bit of harmony in that communication so it's effective yeah yeah it's a uh, learning how the other person is going to communicate for us internally in our offices it's been tremendous because it really has defined who's going to speak when and so understanding that because sometimes the first person to speak is usually not the most knowledgeable they may have experiences they may have some wisdom that they're sharing but it's not not topic specific mm. the one that may delay maybe the high s will delay the conversation and their their communication most time will be more profound than the first one speaking and so it's it's interesting and i'm, I'm fascinated by it but understanding your team there are no two alike ever and so the communication skill really there's a learned discipline in how to communicate and when yeah and when to accelerate when to back off when to get uh, higher or elevated, or when to suppress and be calm. That it tells us when to do that. Yeah. And for, for the longest time we talked about uh, discs, you know, uh, for our, our team. And you never really told me yours. And, and uh, but I, I figured out, I know what it is now. But well, I, I showed you on the board what mine is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
So um, for maybe the listeners who are curious, what, where do you think you would fall in, well, you know where you fall in that disc for you? Well, so the disc gives you a grade, zero to zero to 100 in, in the DISC categories. And I'm above a, a midline D, so I'm, a, I'm about a 70 D. I'm about a 65 I. Uh, I'm about a 55 S and about a 50 or 55 C. Uh, I mean, so I can, uh, if I get in a situation where things become stressful, my S and C become a dominant source and I need to understand the rules of the game. I need to understand uh, more criteria about what we're going to do. What's the system? I'll go straight to this process driven way if the results are not adequate. Otherwise, if that's adequate, my D is always the dominant force and it means I'm always going forward. No matter what's going on, I see the positive in everything. I tend to, uh, I see that everything is possible. I don't see a half glass, you know, half empty. I see it always is half full. Mm. Um, and that's my D that's really rising up. My I, influences that it's a little lower but it influences that that's my ability to talk on a podcast yep. that, that gives me my ability to engage people in groups it's my ability to get on stage and communicate uh that's where the higher i comes in but they influence each other because i'm so right at the 50 yard line so to speak i'm just i'm all four above line it's i don't need to meet my needs i need to meet everybody else's needs so you've heard me talk a lot about serving other people, meeting other people's needs. That's why my disc profile tells everybody. If I were to read it, I would understand a person like me, who they really are. They don't need to meet their own needs. They're going to meet everybody else's. Yeah. It's really dominant that way. That is interesting, man. <laughs> I love that. So there are hundreds of things, you know, that need to get done in business every single day. And, you know... In the busyness of the moment with what's going on, uh, you know, dealing with hair on fire situations, right? Like things are going to get done right now. How do you stay laser focused, uh, you know, on the mission without falling the victim to, uh, you know, death by a thousand cuts, essentially? Like how, what's your, what way do you kind of keep yourself focused and, and, and your team as well? Um, well, if the team's in a panic mode because there's, you know, lots of content coming at them yes. at any time, uh, I, I really assess, you know, what is their communication skill or their characteristic, their natural behavior, and then how can we influence that? I will speak to a high DI in an aggressive way. Usually I'll go at them like I'm a bulldozer because I'm speaking their language. They get really offended, <laughs> but yeah. they, but they yeah. actually shift. Yeah. That's really the only way to do it. Otherwise, they won't pay attention because they're literally chasing freaking dust bunnies. <laughs> they just get lost. So you can go at them very quickly, very aggressively. Boom. They get angry with you. It passes in a few minutes and then they shift and they rethink about what the conversation was. The higher S or C's, you have to be like, hey, I'm just going to plant this seed. Let's talk about it tomorrow and then be very calm because they don't like the aggressive behaviors. In fact, it drives them nuts. So you gotta be very calm about that, very collected. Otherwise they will tend to hold a grudge because the need is, is to make sure they're meeting their need. So it's, it's just a radical difference in, in how to communicate and how to get a result for them. And if you shift them, they will drive a better result for their self, which will ultimately serve the team. That's really interesting and really kind of understanding how to keep them focused and then the communication has to be so different for everyone's communication style to keep them to help them because you, you know that's how you're serving them yeah you know is and i not everyone knows that you know some people just have the same communication style with everyone yeah. <laughs> and you can go around and crush some people yeah and then never help others yeah and we all do that yeah. it doesn't matter how well versed we are in a, in a disc we still go back to our natural first characteristic in everything we do. Unless we really have a refined discipline and be able to critique our communication, we have to think about it for a minute before we act on it. Yeah. And if we do that, we can match up and it, we can drive a better result. Everybody's much better place in their head and because you, you're meeting a result. Because if you shift people, they meet their results. They're much happier people. Yeah, I agree. One of the... 
Well, uh, one of the things I think that you really need to grow professionally, obviously, is you need some feedback, you know? Uh, and we talk about having you with the right circle of friends and that feedback influencing, you know, the decisions you make and how you get better. But how do you feel like you go, uh, how do you go about giving really effective feedback um, while understanding an individual well enough uh, to know, you know, they need what kind of feedback they need, essentially? What What's your, how do you determine that? Well, when they've been around a while, mm -hmm. you can start to get a feel for the, what they need to hear. Uh, that's very different than what, what they want. What, to yeah, hear. what they want. <laughs> yeah, being able to give them honest, straightforward feedback yeah. is critical. You just have to shift how you're going to do that. If it's raw data, great. That works for some. If it's more subdued or suppressed or slow, there may be a better delivery for the S or the C. Um, so that there, it's just a different delivery system. For me, I meet with my managers. I do a one-on-one -on -one weekly and I ask them very first question, what do you have for me? And it's, there's no parameters on that. It's what do you have for me? What are the updates? What kind of feedback? That's really that opportune time to actually give us that feedback and give us that content. And so there's an opportunity and you gotta meet with your managers. Managers are critical. You gotta meet regularly, um, but that's their opportune time to actually tell what's going on. Mm. And then I also do team meetings. So those same managers may be present, but their team is with them. And then we meet with all of those and we do that weekly as well. So there's opportunity for team feedback. How do, how do they be in support? Excuse me. Being supported, not being supported. Gotcha. You got to have those meetings. That's where the feedback comes from. That's interesting. I, I agree. You, you, and from the other side, for us getting the leadership, we need that. You know, we, we need that time too, to be able to connect with you in a very focused manner, a very planned way, and, and get that kind of leadership, that focus back, and that feedback we're looking for as well. Yeah. It, you know, it's an opportunity for us to give, but also to receive from you. It's a it's an opportunity to pause. Yeah. And because everybody, everybody hates meetings. Yeah. And everybody hates meetings because they much prefer to be stuck in their head, I'm busy. And they're just like, this is a disruption. Well, the reality is, is it's actually the one of the coolest gifts because it'll slow you down for a minute it pauses just long enough that you can refocus. Whether it's a refocus from the meeting or a self-adjustment, those little meetings are those opportune times because you express yourself, you rethink it, and then you go at it again. Yeah. It's a good time to pause. Perspective is everything on that. It is. It is really crazy. What uh, was the most helpful feedback that you've ever received for you? Best, best feedback yeah, I've had? Best, most helpful. Most helpful, um, stop and smell the roses. Mm. And that's that's an old cliche, an old, you know, an old saying from a very long time ago. But, you know, up until probably 15 years ago, I really was miserable at doing that. I'm just so driven. That's that 65D that I wear. It's a, it's, <laughs> it's a driving force for me. And the, slowing the smell the roses is extremely difficult sometimes. The way I do that is, one, I have a very structured calendar. I keep my eye on my calendar when I start to feel like I'm lost. I get refocused on that calendar. There's check-in times for what I need to do with family, what I need to do in personal time, and I have to make sure I keep those targets on my calendar. And that gives me that time to check and stop and smell the roses, so to speak. Not great, great at it, by no means. Not great. I'm yeah. a D, I'm an I, and I'm, I'm very driven but I still now do a much better job than I ever did. And it's odd because I, I was saying earlier how my profile is intended to meet others' needs. I'm making sure everybody else tries to figure out how to smell the rose all the time. And I'm miserable at doing it for myself. <laughs> and it's crazy, even for my wife, for employees, I tell them don't work past 45 hours. It's nuts, you don't know what you're doing if you do that. Uh, it's me always trying to meet everybody else's need in in that. So uh, it's, it's smell the roses. That's the one of the, probably the best gifts. Stop and smell the roses. Find a way. Get a discipline. Learn it. Yeah. Because there is some opportunity there. That's great advice. I and, and I don't know who gave it to you, but it, it's super good. And I mean, especially for you, that's I think it's imperative. Yeah. Yeah. Because even uh, high DIs, leaders, CEOs. They need time to, to decompress a little. Yeah. 
Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, so we're gonna wrap up. Awesome. We're gonna have time. I know it goes by so fast. Um, if for all the communication we stuff we've been talking about from disc to giving feedback to understanding people's communication styles, if you could give one piece of advice to leaders out there, uh, what would it be for you? One piece of advice, like what you do. And that's probably another piece of information I was given a long time ago. Like what you do. Stop trying to find everything that's a perfect lineup. Like what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Find a way to enjoy that moment or that thing, whatever that is, even in adversity. And just like what you do. And if you do, your team is going to respond very differently. Very differently. They're going to figure out they can like things. Even in those moments, we call it 80, 20, 75, 25. There's a percentage of our time that we're going to do stuff throughout the week that doesn't work well. We don't align with, we don't like it. We're not, un we're uncomfortable. But those are those moments where you need to find a way to like those moments because they're actually changing us. Yeah. They're growing us, they're opening us, they're making us learn more things. So find a way to like it. Awesome, man. I love it. As always, man, thank you for being on the podcast. I, I love having you here. I love doing this leadership series because I, I learned so much, but I know everyone else does too. So I appreciate you being on the show. Awesome. Man. Thank you. Great to you be bet. here. For everyone else who's listening, hey, if you're listening to us on YouTube, hit the little like. If you're, uh, you're getting value out of what we're bringing you guys, we'd love for you to leave a comment uh, and hit subscribe so you don't miss videos from Jim Robinson. Let's go. Brand. And, uh, you know, for anyone else who's listening on your favorite podcast platform, hit the like button on there, subscribe. And we'd love to hear comments. Uh, if you have questions about leadership in, uh, specifically for Jim, leave them right there and we'll, we'll put them on the air. All right, you guys, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, thank Jim. You. Thank you. See ya. <laughs>